Hi, I'm David Worden. For this segment, I'd like to talk about alternate fingerings. We all started out learning the natural fingerings on the instrument. If you played a three valve instrument to start with, which I did, you learn your B flat scale this way. Natural fingerings, uh, the first ones I learned. So for the low C or D in treble clef, it's one and three. Then we have two different notes that are fingered one and two, the low D or E in treble and the G or A in treble. And those notes work well that, that way. The, we've learned at some point along the way in our development that we don't like using one and three. We really don't like using one, two, and three because they're quite sharp. So that's where the fourth valve comes in. It can replace one and three. So if you get switched to a four valve instrument, you learn that same scale this way. In a sense, that's already an alternate fingering, except that for a four valve instrument, we know it's the best fingering. So the alternate now would be the one and three, which you typically wouldn't use, but occasionally you might find it quicker and useful for some other things. For example, uh, suppose you need a trill from the low D or E in treble, down a step. A little awkward, but you could do third valve on the D. Like that. So it, it's helpful in those situations. Um, other ways alternate fingerings can help are with intonation. On some euphoniums, not so much on this one that I'm playing now, but some instruments are, are fairly sharp up in this range, the F above the staff or the, the G in treble clef. Those three notes are on the sixth partial, the sixth note in the bugle series, starting from the pedal tones on up. For various acoustic reasons, um, that's been a tradition actually among euphoniums. Recently, some are starting to conquer it. This one has done a pretty good job. The other way to solve that is using a trigger on the instrument, but not everybody has a trigger. So if you don't, a trigger means the, the lever that you would push here, push the lever, pushes out the main tuning slide. So if you watch some of the players on YouTube, you'll probably see them with their thumb on a lever. When they get up to those three notes, the F, E, and E flat, or G, F sharp, and F concert uh, treble, the, their thumb will disappear as they push the trigger down to help make them in tune. Another choice though, uh, when I was playing, for example, up to an E flat concert, F in treble, it was quite sharp. I learned though that one and three will pull that down in pitch. The handy thing about that is that it's only adding a fingering, it's not changing totally, so. Not too awkward. But the fingerings that would be, the succession above that would normally be two and three and one and two, going up from one and three. Those are the next two chromatically. They didn't work very well. So on the E natural, F sharp, in treble, I used two and four, which brought that better in tune. On F, open, or fourth. So those, those notes are tricky on many instruments and alternate fingerings like those might help you. You probably wouldn't use them in a fast passage, but certainly on sustained notes, particularly if you're playing with other sections, you probably want to use them. They can help in other uh, areas, for example, up a little higher, high A or a B in trouble, is normally a little bit flat on euphoniums. Uh, not all of them, but many of them are. One and two is actually a good fingering to raise that or brighten it. And even if your horn isn't very flat, even if you normally can lip it, using that fingering at a time when your chops are tired or a time when you want more brilliance on the note is still a doable thing. So intonation is one use. Another use is in playing difficult passages. I mentioned that trill passage earlier. There is a solo I like to play. It's from Vaughn Williams' Tuba Concerto. 
And it's the second movement, which is often played on euphonium. The publisher specifies that as an option, um, or cello or bassoon. About midway through the piece, it starts on the fourth valve. You can watch the fourth valve interact with the others here. I'll play it very slowly. A lot of crossing back and forth. Well, the problem is the tempo is it's got to be fairly facile sounding as you play it. So an alternate you can use is to keep the fourth valve down, add second, and then add one and two. Very quick, it sounds good in context. You're essentially playing on an F euphonium at that point, like an F tuba, would be the fingerings they would probably use. So that's a good one. The most classic example, however, is in band literature. The uh, Gilbert and Sullivan light opera uh, duo produced a, an amalgamation of a lot of their songs into Pineapple Pole. And the first movement of that, which is the overture, opens up with a, a devilish line on the euphonium, but with the woodwinds. Now, the woodwinds have no trouble playing. It will go quite fast, uh, probably 16th notes about there, depending on who's conducting. Well, you know, a lot of times that's not a problem. In this case, you can watch my natural fingerings here for that passage. Starts on a low C concert, or D in treble. A little hard if you're going to go da ba 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 da So what I've often used, it's a stuffy fingering. It feels very stuffy because it is. And I wouldn't want to use it in a solo if I didn't need to. But again, you're not playing a solo, you're playing with the woodwind. So you're just one of the voices in there. It doesn't have to be quite as clear and pristine a tone as you might get with normal fingerings. So I'll use either one and two, or I try to use third valve in addition to fourth. I keep the fourth valve down and add third valve where it's practical to do. Sometimes I'll add one and two depending on the part of the passage. But for that opening part, Pretty easy, just doing this. Fourth valve stays down. So that figure can come in pretty handy in places like that. As I say, that's the classic example. That piece is often on military band auditions and sometimes college auditions. They want to see if you know the alternate fingerings. Now, you can play it naturally. Mark Jenkins has an excellent CD. He's the uh, euphoniumist with the Marine Band, the U.S. Marine Band. On his CD, he recommends playing it with natural fingerings, and he does a great job. Uh, so if you're as good as Mark Jenkins, use the normal fingerings. If you're not, or if you have to prepare it very quickly and don't have those under your fingers, then you can try the alternate. It takes a little practice, but you'll learn it fairly quickly, and it's, you can implement it then in a heartbeat if you want to. My own solo, the Arpeggione Sonata, was based on a piece for a string instrument. It's got a solo that starts on a low C concert, goes down a half step, and then up to a D concert. So the natural fingerings will be. Except it's a fast tempo. It's a little awkward. So what I do is keep the fourth valve down. Because that middle D can be played with or without the fourth valve added to one and two. So that keeps me moving my fingers easily. So in that or in pineapple pole, not only is it easier for me to do, Mechanically, it will sound better to the audience, unless your horn's in perfect shape and your fingers are really coordinated. If you're struggling to play those notes, you'll probably bang on the vowels, and that'll make noise. It makes a mechanical noise that the audience can hear. And it sounds not so good, I think. So if your fingers are moving more smoothly, the mechanical noise is not as great by any means, and it will sound better that way. I feel so passionate about this 
I actually wrote a book, a short book, booklet you might call it, to help you with this. Advanced Fingering Guide, it's called. Cimarron Music publishes it. In that book are all the alternate fingerings that are practically used on the euphonium. And on some notes, you might find eight different fingerings that can all be used on that same note. Looking through those and thinking with some imagination can help you with some of those tricky trills or passages. The uh, book also includes some exercises to see if you've picked up what you've learned or you'll have to play some tunes that are in there without using any natural fingerings, and you'll be able to by that time, we hope. Also in there are some real-life excerpts, either actual pieces or a short exercise I wrote that's close to a piece that was under copyright and I couldn't use it literally, but it will help you with some alternate suggestions in pieces you might have a little bit of struggle with playing normally. Some of them are just simple to help you play, play it more cleanly, like my uh, suggestions in On the Square March, Others, like in the pineapple pole, are to help you just play it at all. So I would suggest that you get the book, uh, either from Cimarron Music. You'll find a link on my website under the uh, Euphonium Books section uh, to help you go directly there. It's also available from Amazon, so you can buy it there. You can download it as a PDF from Cimarron. I think Amazon might have a Kindle version. Or of course you get the printed copy that I just showed you. Either one's available. So get the book. I think you'll find it very useful. These are things you probably should know, and at some point you might be very glad that you know the alternates, and part of the book is teaching you how to figure out the alternates for yourself. So if you don't have the book with you and you're stuck on a passage someplace, the concepts I teach you will help to figure out what would be a better way to approach the passage. I hope you find that useful, and I hope this has been useful. Thank you.